This is a piece of Black Limba, also known as Terminalia Superba for all you science folks out there, and it is from the former Florida Champion Tree. A champion tree is the largest tree of its kind, in this case this was the largest Black Limba tree in the state of Florida. Not to be confused with the largest Black Limba tree in the nation, which would be a national champion tree. If it helps you to picture what's going on, just imagine that this tree was the intercontinental champion of its tree federation, so to speak. Anyhow, I was commissioned to build a sofa table, which is essentially a long skinny table that lines the back of a sofa so that children can eat dinner and watch TV at the same time, all while slowly becoming zombified by an endless plethora of on-demand content, which helps fend off their existential dread. Back to the tree for a moment, my friend PJ actually salvaged this tree from Flamingo Gardens here in South Florida. It came down just after Hurricane Irma, uh, circa 2018, as it was struck by lightning during a tornado that was spun out of one of the passing feeder bands, or something like that. Black Limba is a rather soft species, which actually makes it quite nice to work with hand tools. It's also largely known for its acoustic properties and finds itself being used in guitar building quite often. Onto some actual woodworking commentary, if you want to have better glue-ups, plane or joint your boards in a folded book match, so to speak. By planing the two boards at once, they become complementary, so when folded back out again, each edge is congruent with the other, making for a seamless joint. To glue up this top, I opted for epoxy and used Crackzilla, a Moss Epoxy's product. I really only used this because I forgot that my glue bot was actually behind me the entire time on my wall, and ever since organizing my shop with wall control, I'm still trying to remember where all my gear is now. It's quite amazing how I was able to always know where everything was in my shop when it had no organization and looked like absolute hot garbage, but now that everything is nice and neat on my wall, I'll walk by stuff a handful of times before realizing that it's even there. Anyhow, the other benefit of epoxy was that it allowed me to really take my time and make sure I had all my clamps in place and not worry about fast cure times, especially in this sweltering South Florida heat. Also, there were plenty of punky spots in this black limba, so I felt that using epoxy would also help stabilize any soft spots along the seam. The boards that make up the legs of the table will be about two inches thick, and they've got a large crack running through the heart of the board. Since I want to preserve that fractured look, I'm opting to stitch the crack together with a Japanese-style bow tie known as kinekata. Could also be kinkata. I don't know. I don't speak Japanese. These are pretty similar to standard Dutchman, except they actually look like a bow tie. You'll also notice that I'm using the polished finish blade from Diablo Tools. This was sent to me as part of the Home Depot perspective, and I'm still not great about switching blades in and out for rip and cross cuts, but I did notice that this did leave a wonderful finish on end grade cuts that was similar to a 220 grit finish. Also, I ripped a few boards with it too, cause you know, lazy, and it left a similar finish as well. I also tried out their ultra finish seven and a quarter for standard circular saws and had equal success with the high finish on cross cuts as well. Now if you're curious why everything looks super hazy here, it's actually because the temperature and humidity difference between my air-conditioned house and my shop was so vast this day that a ton of fog built up between my lens and the lens protector. Hooray, heat. Uh, doing inlays like this isn't really a novel process these days. There's products like Slab Stitcher that actually make this even easier than what I'm doing here. For the most part, the process is simple. Just define your mortise by using your actual inlay piece itself, route out the middle, clean up the sides with a chisel, and then hammer that bad boy home. 
It should be worth noting that if your crack dies in the middle of your board, that's where you'll want to put your first inlay since that will keep that crack from getting any deeper or larger, uh, stopping cracks in its tracks, so to speak. April Wilkerson sells a shirt with that saying on it. It's not a Cowdog AF shirt, but whatever. People have their fashion choices, I suppose. Uh, speaking of people on the internet, if you want to follow along for more of my day-to-day -day stuff, I'm basically everywhere on the internet at Cowdog Craft Works, except on Twitter, where I had to be at Cowdog Craft Work because the S was too many characters. With that being said, I don't really know what Twitter is for. I generally use it to let people know about interesting happenings, I suppose. Like that time my wife and I saw Dennis Rodman at the grocery store, and you know, that was cool. Since I already had the epoxy open from the other day, I just chose to use that as well, much for the same purpose. Also, if I had any little gaps or undercuts, the epoxy acts as a nice gap filler, and the finish I'll be using will blend everything together nicely. The joinery here is a shouldered ship miter. A regular ship miter in Japanese is known as Tomikata Sanmai Hozo. I haven't the slightest idea what a shouldered ship miter would be called. What exactly is a ship miter, you ask? Well, it's a miter joint with what I can only best describe as a built in spline. Essentially, the spline extends from one side of the miter, and the other side will have an exposed through tenon of said spline. It's kind of a cool joint. I don't know why the term ship is used here. I imagine it's got some sort of connection to what the kids are saying these days. According to Urban Dictionary, shipping is a verb used to describe an action of wishing for two people to enter a relationship. In this case, it would be myself wanting the tenon side to enter the mortise side of this miter snugly and uneventfully. One of the advantages of this joint is the fact that the splines are formed on one side of the miter itself. As some people are aware, miter joints are notoriously weak because of the fact that it's an end grain to end grain connection. Therefore, having surface area where edge grain can also have glue connectivity will make this joint structurally sound. Furthermore, the shouldered portion that is in the leg creates another area for downward force to be applied, which once again makes this, let's say it all together, more structurally sound. I've just recently gotten into non-disposable Japanese saws, and I have to say that I am absolutely in love. These things cut like absolute lasers. If you have one that's gone through Matate, the professional sharpening, tensioning, and truing process, it's absolutely glorious. Uh, feel free to shoot me any questions about these in the comments below, or go ahead and just shoot me a DM on Instagram. There's so many varieties of these saws, and the Nerd Alert runs real deep here, so I'm happy to chat about these kinds of tools anytime.
The low workhorse I'm using here is a video that's coming out soon, so stay tuned for that. It's a hybrid between a traditional saw bench and a seated workbench, and I'll have a pretty neat announcement along with that video as well when it comes out. For starters, I did ultimately find my glue bot. Uh, this joint was fit in such a way that it was tight, but not too tight. And I assumed that the water content in this tight bond tube would allow everything to swell a bit and create a nice tight fit. And honestly, my assumption didn't disappoint. Whether or not I'm correct in that assumption is another matter altogether. But after it was glued up, the miter and the tenons all had great looking seams. And ultimately that is what really matters. the next day. So after staring at this a while, I wasn't thrilled with the support in the center point of the table, i.e. the middle point between the two legs. This wood is probably only about an inch to an inch and a quarter thick, and at that distance of 69 inches, hey -oh, it felt a bit too flexible for my liking at that center point. Therefore, I opted to go with a stretcher, or perhaps it's an apron, I don't really know. Uh, that is going to run the length of the table, ultimately. It's a piece of ash that was in my lumber pile, and by turning it on its edge, it gives it substantially more strength than if it was on its face. I'm just going to notch it out in the legs and glue it into place. The color was close enough to the black limba, and while it had a little bit of a pink tone, I thought it was just enough of a nice contrast with the grays, yellows, and brown of the limba that it really fit the whole color scheme. Since the tabletop is at 13 inches deep and the legs are only at about 8 inches in depth, they're going to need some feet. These may be called sled style feet perhaps to assist in the cantilever. Since there's going to be children sitting at it behind a couch watching TV to fend off their darkest thoughts of impending mortal doom, we want to make sure they're safe and the table doesn't tip onto them as they lean on the front edge, contemplating their place in the universe or multiverse if you're a uh, big MCU fan I suppose. This is about a 5 inch piece of material and since the video is getting a little bit long at this point I'm just going to use the domino to do a loose tenon joint here. I took a little time to shape them so they're not just two big stupid squares sitting perpendicular to the upright. It took a little bit to get them to match and they're close enough considering they'll be about 69 inches apart and no one will ever really notice to be fair. I don't particularly care to sand stuff, and frankly, I don't think anyone does, but I for the most part prefer sheared surfaces as opposed to sanded surfaces. However, since I'm going to be using Rubio Monocoat as my finish, I have to sand the entire workpiece to 120, or maybe it's 150, I don't know, I went to 120. I actually had a friend of mine who works closely with Rubio ask their folks if you can do a hand plane surface with Rubio, and the response was no. I don't necessarily know how accurate that is, but it does tend to make sense as I assume a coarser surface for this product helps with the adhesion properties. Anyhow, Rubio is a great option for a quick and easy finish. It is a wipe on, sit, and buff off application, and it's ready to handle within an hour or so as opposed to my preferred finish, which is a drying oil such as tongue oil, which takes sometimes weeks to fully cure. And that's it. The Intercontinental Champion of Black Limba Trees in South Florida has been turned into a bougie table that sits behind a sofa for children to eat macaroni and cheese at while wondering if this world is actually a simulation, or if vegetables can feel pain. And if they can, how can you tell? Anyway, thanks for watching, and as always, see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks.